And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Uh, Dr. Jillian Shepard, instructor with the Faculty of Business, and Nicole Helwig, manager, Center for Social Enterprise, and program coordinator for the MBA in Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a presentation on the experiential learning methods of the MBA in Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship, or as it is known here in the Faculty of Business Administration, the MBA SCE. My name is Dr. Jillian Shepard, and I'm the Educational Support Coordinator for the MBA SCE, and I'm responsible for supporting faculty in the development of experiential learning opportunities in their courses and managing the logistics of the program. I'm joined by Nicole Helwig, who is the manager of the Center for Social Enterprise here at Memorial and program coordinator for the MBA SCE. In addition to our staff roles, we are both instructors for select MBA SCE courses. Our goals for this presentation are to share the experiential learning methods that we have used in the MBA SCE so far and engage with you in a discussion about experiential learning, as well as answering any questions you may have about what we have done. Against the backdrop of a traditional business school setting, the MBA SCE is maybe seen as unconventional, unique, and certainly innovative. The variety of experiential methods employed in the MBA SCE come together to produce a holistic program that is deeply rooted in the practical application of content, and we look forward to sharing that with you today. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Nicole Helwig. Uh, a few words on how this presentation ties to the theme of the conference, uh, getting to the heart of learning. So we're talking about, about hands-on learning, work integrated learning. Experiential learning is learning through practice, but it's also about experience and experience that is transformative. We share the MBA in social enterprise and entrepreneurship as an example of what it looks like to create and enable transformation through engaged learning. It is also a program where connections and interactions are key. We are talking about social enterprise and social entrepreneurship. It, that means it is a, about engaging with society, with community, and for the students with each other. Relationships are built and connections are made. Those connections are also made between theory and practice as concept learn, concepts learned in the classroom uh, are applied at different points in their program. Jillian, next slide, please. Great, so what exactly is the MBA SCE? The Master of Business Administration in Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship is the Faculty of Business Administration's newest graduate degree. It is a one year, and that's calendar year, not academic, graduate program with a focus on using business as a vehicle for social change. The MBA SCE is comprised of three semesters. The fall and winter semesters are academic in nature and contain bulk of the coursework. The spring and summer semester is when students undertake a 16 week internship. The first two semesters are broken into four six week modules over which 16 courses ranging from one to three credit hours each take place. These courses include traditional business foundations and social enterprise and entrepreneurship focused content such as social impact measurement. The internship semester can take a variety of forms. Students can choose to intern with a pre-existing organization by way of a hosted internship, or they can apply to do an entrepreneurial internship where they work on their own venture. As part of this internship stream, students can go into Memorial Center for Social Enterprises Incubator, where they work with business advisors from the community and participate in CSE programming. Throughout the entirety of the program, students are immersed in the local social enterprise community, engaging with organizations and individuals who work in this sector. So what, what is social enterprise? Uh, the definitions I get asked this uh, often frequently in my role as a manager of the Center for Social Enterprise. Um, and at an organizational level, we can talk about a business with a social mission um, where there's activity that generates revenue, uh, but aligned with the social um, objective as well. However, the devil is in the details. Um, it is actually quite complex. And 
we can also look at social enterprise as a way to challenge the predominant understanding of business today, where we see the pursuit of wealth at the expense of people and planet. So overall, there is no universally accepted definition. And this is really important for the MBASCE. Uh, as you'll see in our presentation, at various points across uh, their, uh, their program, their, 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 their journey in the program, students are exposed to the diversity of social enterprises and are also asked to interrogate the definitions. We challenge the students to wrestle with their own understanding of social enterprise and what it means to organize for social change. Now, why Memorial and why Newfoundland? Well, we have numerous interesting examples, both historical and contemporary of social enterprise for social change. As we can see from this slide, we are attracting international attention. Uh, it provides opportunities as well through the program. Students are able to engage with social enterprises in real time with practitioners who are hand, uh, on the ground doing the doing um, and in a variety of contexts. So that provides a certain benefit, uh, again, tied to their experiential learning here in the province. Next slide, please. So the MBA SCE is a new kind of business education for a new kind of leader. We've focused on creating a space for potential students who perhaps would not have otherwise seen themselves going to business school. The folks that we are hoping to recruit come from a diverse range of backgrounds and interests, and they all share a similar purpose or calling, which is to do social good. These students are focused less on climbing the corporate ladder and more on supporting people, developing communities, and leading socially innovative ideas and initiatives. Many uh, who are intrigued by the prospect of an MBA in social enterprise and entrepreneurship tell us that they've never seen business school as something that was for them or within their reach, but the MBA SCE changes all of that. And here's a quick look at our first two cohorts. So the inaugural cohort of 2019-2020 was made up of 14 students with international students joining us from Iran, the US and Nigeria. The group had backgrounds in finance, engineering, computers, computer science, social work, business, arts, education, music, environmental design and theology. Also in this picture with the students are myself and Nicole, as well as John and Peggy Fisher, two of our community partners who own Fisher's Loft in Port Rexton. The second cohort who are about to embark on their internships for the summer semester is a group of 10 students with some coming from as far as Mexico and Ghana, mid pandemic, no less, to join the program here in Newfoundland. Amongst this group, we have folks with backgrounds in recreation, psychology, neuroscience, business, social work, dentistry, engineering, arts, library and information sciences, and social responsibility. As you can see, the MBA SCE has indeed already drawn a very diverse pool of students. We hope to continue this trend in the future, and we can certainly already see that cohort three, which will start in just a few short months from now, September, will be equally unique. Before we dig into the actual activities of the past two years, we'd like to first share with you this infographic. It's an aspirational roadmap that we uh, or helped us capture what we imagined for the first cohort of the MBA SCE, and it gave us a structure that we could build on and develop as the program goes. These elements will be discussed in more detail over the course of our presentation, but the image gives you a sense of the structure, particularly for the four modules, as well as how and where the experiential learning activities are included. Given that in the middle of module three in the first cohort, we were struck with Snowmageddon, followed only weeks later by a global pandemic, you can imagine that this structure has had to be both flexible and responsive to the needs of the students and the faculty. And we'd like to give a very special shout out to Jane Costello, our senior instructional designer at CITL, who has been integral to the development of this program. The MBA SCE is without a doubt an innovative program. And with that comes a need for some experimentation, imagination, creativity, and play. And in terms of structure, if we look at the lower part of the, the graphic, we see that the modules, in fact, be, could become very fragmented. 
The idea of creating the arcs, where uh, arcs of reflection and also arcs of engagement, uh, were a way of weaving across the program. Of course, another link throughout the program that's consistent is the cohort itself and that shared experience, which pulls them through, again, this journey uh, through their studies. Um, to weave through the arcs, we uh, added different activities outside lectures and also within coursework to achieve um, that sense of uh, progression across the arcs. And uh, of course, experiential learning was another um, uh, activity throughout with what I'd call a, a quasi capstone, which was their reflections course at the end of the program. Uh, next slide, please. We also thought it useful to share the learning outcomes of the program. Um, these were mapped across each of the different courses uh, in all the modules. They were also used by students to create their own, le own learning goals for their internships. And finally, they also helped us create those experiential learning opportunities that uh, we describe in the presentation um, that follows. Jillian, next please. So we'll dive into some of these activities. Um, the MBA SCE has its own five day orientation week each year. So separate from grad studies or other activities that go on in the campus, this is the MBA SE's own orientation. The week helps students get familiar with Memorial and the Faculty of Business Administration, but also builds relationships with their peers, helps them meet the faculty and staff and learn about the history of Newfoundland and Labrador and its social innovation and social enterprise sector. The activities included in orientation week are planned specifically to sort, support these goals and to set the tone for the rest of the year by bringing in the themes that we hope to weave through coursework and extracurricular activities. And we'll share a few of these with you now. So on FBA day, we organized uh, an icebreaker activity, was, which was during orientation week, the very first time the students were able to come together and introduce one another and meet one another. So it was really used with uh, an, uh, truly as an icebreaker activity. Uh, we tried to find something um, was actually inspired from an activity that I had experienced at a uh, at a retreat where uh, we would find something that would be uh, that would tie to some of the themes of the MBASE and uh, change making. Uh, the activity was fairly simple. Uh, we called it a future uncertainties icebreaker where students walked around a room, looked at different images describing some of the the important challenges we face in the world today um, and have we challenge them to wonder what the would the outcomes be 10 years from now would they be better or for worse and students place themselves along uh, different axes so uh, across the room how positive or, or rather how pessimistic or optimistic did they feel and then through lengthwise across the room um, what was their sense of agency strong or weak and then depending on where they landed, we went from student to student where they introduced themselves and explained uh, why they were standing in their place uh, in the room today. So a very interesting way for change makers to explain in some ways how they ended up in the program, but who they were and uh, what they felt that they would be able to do to change the world. And so then we had our uh, sustainability day, which was with first light and we kicked off this day by participating in a cultural humility training session uh, led by staff from first light. The students convened at Signal Hill campus Emera innovation exchange for a 3 hour workshop. One goal of the MBA SCE is to continually draw threads of indigenous ways of knowing and learning throughout the program. By starting the year with cultural humility training and lands based education. We hoped to introduce students to the Indigenous cultures of Newfoundland and Labrador and share ways that the Indigenous people of this island have and are involved with social enterprise. So the activities, so first the, the cultural humility training was um, held indoors um, in a lecture or workshop type setting. Um, then we were able to go outdoors uh, for lands based education and all of this was led by our partners at first light, uh, formerly the St. John's Native Friendship Center. 
Um, and I was fortunate to accompany the, the students um, on that event. The students uh, went out for a hike. Um, there was berry picking. Um, we uh, baked bannock together over a fire and boiled Labrador tea. And at the end, what you see in this picture is a sharing circle. Um, we had some music from um, our partners and then students were all, everyone in the circle was asked to share something they were grateful for. And we certainly were grateful for that beautiful day that we had and that, uh, again, social bonding experience for all the students. Um, again, it was something that was helping to build the, that cohesion within the cohort, but it was also a way to start planting some seeds uh, for them to think about sustainability, what it means um, to think through uh, what it means, uh, uh, you know, planning for seven generations, hearing that um, Indigenous perspective and how it was all tied to their studies, which were about to start. It also has a connection to the following day when we brought the students to the colony of Avalon. So it was uh, by design that they spent the day first learning about in, in Indigenous uh, peoples uh, and Canada and Newfoundland and Labrador in particular, because the colonial legacy that is evident by the very name of our province is a significant backdrop to the exploration of social enterprise in Newfoundland and Labrador. Next, please. So on the final day of orientation week, as Nicole has mentioned, we took the class out to Fairyland, which is just about one hour outside of St. John's. The students participated in a tour of the Colony of Avalon archaeological site, and they learned about the history of colonial settlement in the province. Um, following the tour of the site, we did hike out to the lighthouse and we had lunch at the lighthouse picnics. And as you can see, it was a beautiful sunny day. The activity again helped to set the, the backdrop of social enterprise in Newfoundland and Labrador by giving historical and social context. It also got the students' brains thinking about what exactly a social enterprise is. For example, some students asked if a historical tourism based business could be considered a social enterprise. And it's interesting to note that for the current second cohort, our living lab partner is the Colony of Avalon Foundation. More on that later. Spending the week together helped to forge the bond amongst the students and prepare them for the busy academic program that was to come. So after uh, orientation week, um, again, built, starting to build the points that would create our arc, um, the students were prompted with a reflection activity, very simple one, where uh, which is essentially called a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, the students were asked to find an image, uh, draw one, paint one, um, and uh, share it with the others and share along with that a description of why, of what that image represented to them um, and its meaning, uh, its connection to the experiences that they'd had during uh, orientation week. Um, I share some of those images here. Um, students shared a lot of photographs, uh, some uh, a lot of photographs from the, week, the, the orientation week, but also their own creations. And there were recurring themes, uh, colonization, learning from the past for the future, sustainability, connections, a lot about food and its importance for um, um, getting to know one another uh, and the importance of learning um, uh, and its importance for learning and sharing with each other. Now, if you'll indulge me, I'll share a couple of examples of what students wrote to, to accompany their images. For example, uh, while continent was certainly important, what's more valuable to me is seeing the openness with which everyone approached the week. Everyone's eagerness to learn about new or one's own culture exemplified cultural humility. The point being, it is imperative that we look back in order to look forward. Cultural humility provides a foundation on which we can explore solutions to a better, more sustainable future. Another example, what this image represents is a marriage between the colonized and the colonizer and hope for the future. Hope that certain principles of Indigenous people, which align with the modern definition of sustainability, can be incorporated in mainstream society. It's by returning to these old principles, we may find a path forward to a sustainable, balanced future. And one quick last one. Growing up, 
I always thought that the colonization of the British to the Africans is the reason Africans are gradually losing their identity or culture, which is our beauty. However, going on the trip gave me a completely different perspective, which is modernization is no excuse to forget our culture. It only makes it more beautiful. Uh, next slide, please. At the end of September, we took this first cohort on a three day excursion around the bay to immerse them in community and students participated in a variety of events hosted in three communities on the Bonavista Peninsula. Several of the guests we interacted with on this trip had continual contact with the students then throughout the program and this helped draw the thread of continuity and connection with community through the program from start to finish. So in Port Rexton, we stayed and were based out of Fisher's Loft, and we also worked and, and interacted closely with John and Peggy Fisher. Um, and then we had panel discussions that included the Fishers, as well as Sonia Mills from Port Rexton Brewery, and David Ellis and Sue Asquith from the Two Whales Community. Uh, sorry, Two Whales Cafe. In Bonavista, we did a tour of the community and several major uh, sites out there with David Bradley from the Bonavista Historic Townscape Foundation. And then we had a round table with David, as well as John Norman, the mayor of the community and uh, entrepreneur behind Bonavista Living, as well as Paula Roberts, an economic development officer from the now broken up TCII department, and uh, Marilyn Coles Haley, from the Home from the Sea Sealers Memorial in Elliston. And then in Port Union, we took a tour of the Coker Bungalow Museum and the Fisherman's Union Museum. And also on the ride home, we had the fun experience of uh, having a little bit of an impromptu Newfoundland kitchen party on wheels on the bus ride home. And this was a lot of fun uh, for our international students in particular, as they got to learn about another piece of our Newfoundland culture and enjoy time with friends and bonding with the cohort. So why these communities? Uh, well, they were chosen for a different number of reasons. Um, they were able to demonstrate different approaches. Again, as Julian mentioned, we visited a, a local brewery, a hotel slash conference center, restaurants, etc was an opportunity to uh, explore at the ground level community enterprise, uh, how and how community benefits, uh, how decisions were made by the business owners um, and their integratedness uh, due to being in part of a small community and a small economy. We also saw some interesting examples of socially focused uh, enterprises, those built on assets, uh, built assets and heritage. Um, as for Port Union. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it was an opportunity to integrate theory from the classroom um, uh, while being on site. Uh, in this picture, you see me wearing my uh, course instructor hat. Uh, I was one of two in co instructors for a course introductions to social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, and social innovation. And we built part of our, our course time and our, our course objectives into the visit to um, Port Rexton, Bonavista, and in particular, Port Union. And for the benefit of those of you who are unfamiliar um, with uh, uh, Port Union, we've explored the history of Sir William Coker, who led the founding of the Fishermen's Protective Union. Uh, it was formed in part to counter exploitation in the fisheries where a system of credit um, uh, given by merchants um, who gave supplies to, pardon me, merchants who gave supplies to fish harvesters on credit, and but then also set the prices for the fish that the fish harvesters would sell to pay off their debt. So the site at Port Union, again, we were able to visit uh, Sir William Coker's home. We were also able to visit um, the, the foundation which preserves some of the artifacts of Port Union, which was the only union built town in North America, where Coker and the Fishermen's Protective Union workers set up their own enterprises to intervene in the fisheries and create a market um, that was otherwise um, run by the mer merchants, pardon me. So here we are discussing some of the concepts that we were we were that were introduced in the classroom. Was Sir William Coker a social entrepreneur? In what ways were the union enterprises social enterprises? And what, what social challenge were the enterprises 
trying to address. Um, and the importance of social change uh, through the organizing of these different types of uh, enterprises and activities such as the union. Uh, next slide, please. During the trip, um, the students were also given a couple of activities. Uh, we would call them reflections on the spot uh, or impressions on the spot. Um, here are some statements that stayed with them um, from their interactions with community entrepreneurs. Uh, it revealed some underlying business concepts. For example, what does competition mean for social entrepreneurs? How are strategic decisions made? Uh, how do you have the first mover advantage as a vegetarian restaurant in, in uh, rural Newfoundland and Labrador? Um, and also, it, it helped to start raise some characteristics of social entrepreneurs and social enterprise. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also had them put bring some thoughts together to create a word cloud, and these are uh, statements that they came up with. Once back in St. John's after the, the trip, all of these experiences, again, were tied back to the course I mentioned um, and the paper, their assignment that was due, where they were asked to uh, examine the different uh, established definitions of social enterprise um, and uh, state their position. What was their understanding of social enterprise, uh, how they came to know it, and uh, capture it at that point in module one at the very beginning of their program. Next slide, Jenny. So field trips or day trips to local social enterprises within the St. John's area have been integral to providing real life, real life context for the cohorts. These field trips have been sprinkled throughout the program tied to courses and coursework in an effort to bring the theory of classroom learning to life in front of the eyes of the students. I'll speak quickly to the, their experience at the gathering place, uh, which is a local agency. Um, that is known for supplying meals to people who are uh, guests at the gathering place and providing other social and uh, material supports. Um, the students had an opportunity to have a tour of the, the building uh, to see the boutique that is there, which is a place that uh, receives and distributes uh, clothing in particular, as well as some uh, uh, toiletry supplies. Uh, students were able to help prepare lunch for guests of the gathering place uh, in the kitchen. And they also spent time chatting with the guests, um, even playing cards. At the end, we also had a, a meeting, a discussion with the executive director of the gathering place, who spoke more about the work um, and how it was uh, uh, how it was involved with social enterprise activity. So that field trip was from the first module. And then in the second module, the students for their marketing course divided into two groups um, and took on marketing projects for two local social enterprises within our community. Um, in order to fully understand and work through this process, they took day trips to the sites of Giacoso, um, which is the community music uh, social enterprise run by the Munn School of Music, and also to Fishing for Success in Petty Harbor. Students worked with the leadership of both of these organizations to develop marketing strategies and plans, and then they then presented the plans to the clients at a, the final class for the course. Um, and then we went to, well, we had a guest speaker from the executive director from Smart Ice. And uh, this is Carol Ann Harding. And after she spoke about funding and governance, students visited the Smart Ice Center here in St. John's to see how the technology is designed and constructed. And we learned more about their operations in both St. John's and their main headquarters. Smart Ice's St. John's location is housed in, within the Choices for Youth Social Enterprise Hub. Um, and so the students also had an opportunity to learn about the various um, or uh, businesses run by that organization, as well as the wraparound supports provided to the youth involved with their programming. Choices for Youth and Smart Ice are leading social enterprises doing some seriously impactful work here in our community, and we are lucky to collaborate with them and count them among our community partners. Um, yes, thank you. So, um, I will speak quickly to first light again. Uh, we had uh, where we see the students um, um, at the bottom uh, right. 
photo. They're actually in the sanctuary of the Cochrane Center, which is a social enterprise uh, run by First Light. So you'll remember we had the session out on the land with First Light. Uh, we also brought a discussion uh, around social innovation, in particular, truth and reconciliation um, as a process of social, social innovation into the introduction course I mentioned. Um, that was uh, organized uh, with help and contributions from a colleague at the Indigenous Student Resource Center, Valerie Pilgrim, and that was really a very emotional, moving um, um, uh, intervention that we had during the course. And then as, a, as a, a, another activity, we actually went and visited um, and had a session with First Light, a round table, learning about what they do, but also about the social enterprises they run. And it was very interesting to see how it tested some of the, the assumptions students had about social enterprises. I remember in particular how uh, eyebrows were raised when students realized the percentage, uh, the quite high percentage of revenue that was generated through the social enterprises of First Light, where often the assumption is that um, the uh, revenue generated from a social enterprise, in particular a nonprofit or a registered charity, is a smaller addition to donations and grants, where First Light shows no, it's quite a significant part of their uh, of their budget. It was also an opportunity to see reconciliation in action, and I use those words to quote a student who brought that up during uh, our discussion. As mentioned, the students are standing in the sanctuary of a church, Cochrane Street United Church, uh, now repurposed uh, as a social enterprise, preserving the activity of the church in the sanctuary, but housing a lot of other social enterprise activity, which are all managed through their partnership with First Light. I'll also share one other comment uh, raised by a student during that session, which I think was uh, quite impactful. And I believe, Jillian, we had this session during uh, the winter semester in Module 3. So the students had already had uh, you know, tra um, traversed a, a certain uh, more than half of their MBASE journey at this point. And a student had said, part of learning is unlearning. And I think that was one of the, the really interesting takeaways from that session and again uh, highlighting how students were being challenged to continue thinking about social enterprise and what it means for them throughout the program. The other photo you see here on screen is a picture from an event called the Place Dialogues, which is um, run in part with the Center for Social Enter Enterprise um, and two of our international students getting an up close look at uh, gutting and cleaning fish at Fishing for Success, the island rooms of Petty Harbor. So for each cohort that goes through the MBA SCE program, we have a living lab embedded or woven throughout, and this living lab engages a community partner. The partnership continues to grow and deepen each year, and it's certainly faced some challenges given the COVID-19 pandemic, but we do hope to continue working alongside community um, to bring meaningful educational experiences to our students and to support social enterprises in the province that can benefit from the interaction with the Faculty of Business Administration. For the first cohort, we worked with Munn School of Music's social enterprise Giacoso, a community music program that brings studio music education or one to one music lessons to communities beyond the overpass where music educators are in relatively short supply. Graduate students from the School of Music traveled to Clarenville one weekend a month to give music lessons and then uh, taught virtual or remote music lessons on the other weeks. The MBASE students were able to support this program and enhance their own learning by working alongside Giacoso's administrative team to help develop the marketing strategy, a plan for a provincial rollout of the program, and even gave input on things like the logo design, which you see here. The MBASE students gained valuable experience through each of these exercises and got a firsthand insight as to what consulting work with community might look like and how these skills can be applied to a real social enterprise startup. Cohort 2, as I mentioned, has been working with the Colony of Avalon Foundation in Fairyland. Together, they have examined policies and procedures for reopening the foundation in a pandemic environment as well as marketing strategies and accounting and streamlining the operations of the tours and gift shop. 
The pandemic forced many of our interactions with the Colony of Avalon Foundation to happen virtually. However, students were able to visit the site in January, just before the second lockdown here on the Avalon Peninsula. And the photo you see is the students moving through the Interpretation Center going to the Conservation Lab in the Colony of Avalon building. Thank you. So moving on, uh, the internships, as previously mentioned, are a quite a significant portion of the students um, uh, experience in the MBASE, important part of their program that lasts approximately 16 weeks long. And there are two pathways. Students could be hosted in uh, through a placement at a social enterprise uh, and, or they could work on their own social venture. So we have placements and we have uh, an entrepreneurial path as well. I might also say that they have two experiences. One is the hands on experience working on their own ventures or through their placements, but they also have coursework. Um, last year, I facilitated cohort one, meeting them every couple of weeks, every two weeks for a session, um, and we would discuss particular topics. Uh, fostering discussions tying uh, what they had learned in coursework, so theories and concepts with the practice that they were seeing and experiencing, <clears throat> pardon me, on their internships. Um, as an example, uh, we discussed organizational culture, so they had seen that as part of their, their class uh, coursework, um, and uh, they had um, an opportunity to discuss that and, and describe how they were seeing that expressed through their onboarding process um, and other um, um, evidence that they were finding during their, their internships. So the objectives of the internship course were to allow students an opportunity to apply and explore course concepts uh, in an area of particular personal interest within the field of social enterprise. And students would, were uh, able to uh, formulate their own learning goals across their internships and decide on their propose their final deliverable for evaluation. And the majority of students submitted, I should say all of the students uh, submitted reflection uh, papers. Uh, they were also guided through reflection through each session with me. Um, I provided um, uh, one or two uh, reflection questions at the end of each session. Um, so it COVID-19, of course, did have some impact on those internships. Uh, they, um, they were just about to roll out, of course, when the pandemic hit. So everything suddenly moved to remote work, uh, which then became part of um, their, um, their interrogation on their internships. What was it like to have that experience of a remote internship and how did it affect, did it affect their learning and their experiences as they went along? Next, please. So as you can tell, reflection is an important piece of the MBA SCE um, and an important part of the experiential learning model. And we incorporate it in the program in several different ways. Um, one of these ways is by hosting reflection huddles at the end of each academic module. Um, and so for cohort one, where we got to do most of these in person, um, we had uh, different themes and talking points for each huddle. At the first huddle, we discussed and listened to a song called Carry It On by Buffy St. Marie, um, and students were provided with the song lyrics, some of which are shown on the slide here, and they were asked to share their interpretation of the meaning of the song and how it could relate to social enterprise and social innovation. For the second huddle, we provided some guiding questions for the students to consider in advance of getting together. And then when they arrived, they were to put their own questions anonymously in a basket. Um, over the course of the huddle, I pulled out the questions and read them aloud and we discussed them as a group. At the end of huddle, uh, uh, sorry, module three, we were supposed to have a group panel discussion with some community partners. And the end of huddle three coincided with the closure of campus for the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown here in Newfoundland. And the connection, uh, sorry, so we, we ended up moving to Zoom and because it was new to us at the time, um, we ended up just having our students and, and team, staff and faculty 
um, so no, no community partners. We asked the students, however, what connections they've made across their academic portion of the program and what questions they would ask of the community partners now having been through the coursework. We wrote the questions down, grouped them into categories, and discussed our responses or interpretations of the ideas together. And um, then in the final course of the program, which is 8518 Reflections, um, the students, I, I was the course instructor for that uh, final academic requirement, and the students in cohort one were asked to write a paper based on their journey throughout the program, considering um, the first paper, which Nicole has already mentioned, that they wrote in the introductions course on what exactly they thought social enterprise was, how it was defined, and what those concepts included. The project has evolved for cohort two. This year, they'll be asked to take several pieces of coursework um, and experiences that they've had, both during the program and before the program, and then they'll give their own TED Talk style presentation which outlines their journey into the social enterprise world and their uh, ideas surrounding these concepts. As a final reflection huddle for cohort one at the end of the year in August, we did bring in three of those community partners for virtual discussion. Um, so we had Joanne Thompson, who was the executive director at the time of the gathering place. We had John Fisher again from Fisher's Loft and David Bradley from the Bonavista Historic Townscape Foundation. Together, the students got into small groups with each individual, which they rotated through each person, and discussed their thoughts and learnings and asked questions. Cohort 2 will participate in a similar exercise later this summer as a way, again, of bringing together the community partners with the cohort to share their learnings, observations, and ask questions, and to celebrate the cohort's completion of the program. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation on experiential learning methods in the MBA in social enterprise and entrepreneurship. We are very proud of this innovative and exciting program, and we look forward to its continued growth and development, as well as seeing what our graduates can do to create lasting positive social change in our communities. Thank you for me as well, and we're very pleased to open the floor now to uh, questions. Uh, which can come through chat. Uh, we have our um, facilitators to help us. So we're, we're hoping to have a free flowing conversation as, as much as the technology will allow. Any questions? I do see that um, Jane Costello is in the participants list. Jane is our our superhero senior instructional designer who's been with this program since the beginning. So Jane, thank you. Big shout out to you. Hi, Jane. Thank you. And also I, I see uh, Nancy <laughs> Beaton is there. Nancy was involved as well in the development of our living lab, our virtual online uh, case study. That's awesome too. So thank you to Nancy. We've had a lot of help from CITL to bring many of these activities to life. I might add there that uh, in some ways we had already been speaking with CITL, but the fact that we had entered the, the pandemic, especially knowing that cohort two was going to be starting their program entirely remotely, uh, it was uh, an opportunity to, to seize in many ways. And I don't know if Jillian, if you want to talk a little bit about the the uh, video production with the Colony of Avalon. Yes, so we um, got sorted with Colony of Avalon Foundation being our living lab uh, partner for this year, uh, and it kind of happened rather quickly in the summer. Um, knowing that we would be online, how could we deliver an immersive experience to the students and give them all the knowledge of the living lab partner? So with CITL, um, Jane and, and Nancy and the whole team, um, we worked on developing this online case study, which is hosted in Brightspace. Um, so in addition to just being written content, we wanted it to be more engaging. Um, and so myself and, and the team from CITL went out to Fairyland and um, filmed um, about two days worth of scenery and interviews with key um, stakeholders and board members in that um, the organization and the community. 
And then all of the content was edited into short videos that were inserted into the Brightspace shell um, along with the written and, and still photo content um, to enhance the understanding of the different areas uh, of, of the case study. And students have used the case study in these videos throughout the year because the the coursework is tied in. So again, they've done operations management project on how to streamline the um, tours and the gift shop operations at the Colony of Avalon site. Um, and the case study provides background and necessary information, financial documents, that kind of, of information to the students so that they have that as a reference throughout the, the coursework. Jane left us a comment there about working pleasure to work with the program. It has certainly been wonderful. She's been a great resource. And if there aren't any questions, I wonder if there are any comments about anything that we've we've shared. Uh, we'd also be happy to have any feedback um, as uh, this is this continues to be uh, an ongoing experiment, something that's on, that's that has its development that uh, that continues to evolve. So, be happy to hear uh, uh, thoughts, comments as well. I got a co comment slash question. Um, how do you think you know social enterprises? Um, you know, different when you get rural Newfoundland compared to St. John's. Like um, a lot of the examples that came up. Uh, throughout the session were probably in rural Newfoundland, but obviously somewhere um, uh, in St. John's. But I, I noticed maybe a slight difference in the type of service they were providing. Do you think there really is a substantial difference in, in a social enterprise in a rural setting compared to St. John's, or is, am I overthinking this? Nicole, do you want to take that first? I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> I uh, did, but I'll let you do it first. <laughs> well, uh, it's an interesting question, Don Jonathan, and I think it comes back to that question about what is social enterprise. And w one way that I approach uh, you know, answering that question is to say it really uh, varies very much on context. Um, if you look at what a social enterprise might mean to a community, say in sub-Saharan Africa or um, you know, with some part, uh, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A mid-developed country in in Southeast Asia, the context really matters. Part of that is jurisdictional, but thirdly, it needs the economic and social contexts. So one one point that we raise with students is is there's social in that word, and we're talking about social good. But who decides what is social good? What what in some cases the creation of jobs is already a significant social impact for communities. Um, in other cases, that's not the the main fo the the main uh, focus. It's a given that the job creation is there. The uh, the impact that's created through the enterprise activity may be of another nature. Addressing, for example, uh, the needs of people who are, are experiencing homelessness, for example. So rural the rural context is really interesting. Um, we're looking at smaller economies. We're able to have that direct contact with people and see how. Again, in the Port Rexton example, how if you had the hotel on its own, it's one thing, but the hotel working with uh, a brewery, working with a with a restaurant, it starts to form that small economy and that strength is there through the interactions and the overlapping of those different enterprises. And where the mindset of the business owners is focusing on the development and the sustainability of their communities, it's something that becomes really powerful. That can also be reflected within, say, St. John's in St. John's neighborhoods. Um, it does change when you start to look at a, you know, the level of a, of a, a city uh, or a province or country as well. Yeah, so I, I would echo Nicole's comments in that the context is so important. And I think here in Newfoundland, um, we, we see an interesting economic history in that once the fishery collapsed, a lot of the smaller rural areas struggled to have an economy and what was going to enable the families and the people of the communities to stay where they were in their homes. Um, and so it's interesting to see um, Bonavista in particular is 
very well into this process of diversifying the types of businesses and the activities that are in their community. And they've done a really good job, the built heritage, um, restoring buildings and, and facilities in that uh, community and repurposing them. Um, one of my favorite examples is the, I can't remember the history of the building off the top of my head, but it's become, it's just a little small space that has now become the community gym and fitness center. Um, and through a, a social enterprise type model, they're able to keep um, the cost of membership quite low, um, but it becomes then accessible to everybody in the community in the area. Um, and then one of the things for me is is about community and building the connections and so that often you see much stronger in a small community or rural area where um, in Newfoundland everybody knows each other kind of thing um, and you can work together and as we mentioned earlier um, what is competition when you are friends as well and how can you cooperate and work together to strengthen and build your community um, in in a big city that would become more in some ways separate or or distinct from one another as um, organizations or industries can be working in their own silos it's it can be more difficult to integrate um, just because of the sheer size and the magnitude of people and uh, issues that you're dealing with so the rural experience for me is a really interesting one um, because it's so very relevant here in newfoundland Thank you, Gus. Yeah, I, I, I agree that um, when you look at social enterprises in small rural town areas, there's obviously such a um, there's a need for the employment, um, and there's a lot of opportunity, I think, but uh, there's obviously a lot of challenges as well. Well, challenges in starting any type of enterprise, obviously, but um, more so, uh, I think, when they're talking social enterprises. So we do have uh, some more time for some questions. So we'll we'll I'll pause again briefly to see if there's any other questions or comments. Um, the chat in the bottom right hand corner, it's the speech balloon icon. Uh, you can either place your question there or um, just note that you'd like to speak, and uh, we'll call upon you. And we would also be open to hearing other folks' uh, experience or experiential learning methods that they use. Um, if anybody has something like that that they'd like to share, something they've tried. I have two questions. Though. Uh, first of all, great presentation, and I think it's a really cool program in terms of uh, going to the communities and talking to them. So my question is related to that. Like it's it's very unique uh, program in a sense in terms of outreach from the university to the community. And so I was curious, like, how was the perception of the community when uh, they were approached through this program? And secondly, was there any new learning through this interaction, like any definition of social impact that we might think that you, got, you guys got to learn of in their understanding? What is social impact for them, which might be different than our understanding of that? Um, so, Shivam, if I'm if I'm right, you're asking what the community thought. The first question was what the community thinks of the interaction and how they're taking it. Um, so far, everything has been very positive. I think the community is very interested. These organizations are very interested in having the support of the Faculty of Business Administration in this program and the expertise that can be shared by our faculty and staff, um, as well as the students who are very interested and passionate in, in this uh, sector. So. Thus far, we've had a very warm welcome from all of the organizations we've interacted with them. We've forged some um, strong partnerships with kind of a small group, um, but then we try to continue always to reach out to and engage with new organizations that we haven't maybe done so with in, in recent times. So we try to keep it diverse and keep um, the opportunity open to as many organizations as possible. Um, part of that happens through the engagement with the coursework and the experiential um, activities, but also through internships um, and our connections with the Center for Social Enterprise, which Nicole manages. Um, so in the internships, uh, the hosted internships, we have students placed with a variety of organizations. Um, some of them, such as Stella Thurkle, had, an, had a student last year for an internship and they have an, another student this year for an internship doing different things, different activities, um, because the Stella Circle is so big, they have many facets that students can get involved with no matter what their interests are. Um, and we have other organizations that are taking on a student for the first time or had one last year but aren't this year. 
different scenarios such as that. Um, a lot of the connection also comes from from the interests and what the students are wanting to do and then what the needs are in the community. So when we're planning activities, um, myself and Nicole and the faculty members who are involved, we might be looking for specific partners. So in the case of the Smart Ice Executive Director, that organization has won um, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth in funding. So we had them into our funding social ventures class to talk about what that's like from the recipient side. Um, and then we had a, a session with another guest speaker who would talk about it from a funders side, the granting agency. So we do look um, for specific scenarios um, or people that are doing certain types of work involved in certain areas, um, which helps the success rate of a particular activity or engagement. Um, but then also, you know, in seeing what's needed and where we can help and what we can be involved in. I mean, that yeah. lends itself to success as well. Uh, I can just add that what we are trying to do is to um, riff off, I suppose, as an expression, um, uh, what we do at the Center for Social Enterprise when we're working with community. Um, there, we consider community our partners. So we speak of we don't speak of hosted organizations where we place students. We speak of our community partners, and we do what we can to work together to co-create the learning experiences for for students. And uh, 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 to respond to your second question, you learning about social enterprise. I remember when we had a panel discussion in Port Rexton, and Dave and Sue from Two Whales um, Restaurant were speaking. And David said that they'd never considered themselves a social enterprise, which I think was really interesting. It's some, it's not uncommon. A lot of social enterprise activity is happening, and those who are doing it are not necessarily identifying, self-identifying with the concepts. Um, and he had said that while he was preparing for the panel discussion and reading up about social enterprise, he was beginning to own, we are social entrepreneurs. And the value that they were creating was very interesting to contrast what we see with the, you know, the current paradigms of, of the business and maximizing profit, you know, the value that was being created in their community. They support youth to get some training working in their restaurant. And just that ethos, that approach that they were using, it was very interesting to see them react uh, and um, uh, respond to the, the discussions and to the concepts that we were examining with students, but by extension, we're extending those conversations and discussions to them. So I just share that anecdote. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds really cool and really nice, the, the interaction with the, because I think it's one of the unique program in that sense. So, yeah, I'm yeah thank you, Shiva. very glad to hear this. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, it's uh, 11, 11 o'clock. Um, I want to give a, a big thank you to both uh, Jillian and Nicole. Um, personally, for me, this was a very interesting uh, discussion, not only uh, in, in my work at CITL, though I strongly believe in experimental uh, or experiential learning, sorry. Um, but I'm from rural Newfoundland, and uh, my family, my father, spent significant time in his life starting a number of uh, cooperative businesses in my hometown. So, uh, yeah, uh, social enterprise is definitely something um, near and dear to my heart, I'll say. So, uh, not only thank you for your great presentation today, but also for your work to just uh, in fostering social uh, entrepreneurship. Um, I think it's uh, important to the survival of rural Newfoundland, personally. Thank you, so, Jonathan. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying thank you, Jonathan. <laughs>